great dancers here in the middle of St. Stephen's Green. I am Neve Shaw and this is On the Sofa and this is an event that's been created with Cush Kane, Dance Company, British Council, Science Gallery and myself because we really care about climate change and we wanted to do something completely different. So rather than have you come to a place to talk about climate change, we wanted to bring it to you and we want to show you today some of the people that really inspire us that are doing very interesting things to think about how we can make climate change more personal. This is part of a much bigger project called Building Spaces of Possibility. We'll be working with British Council and Science Gallery and Cushkin and ourselves to really discover that and to create a much bigger dance piece and combine scientists and dancers together to create the most amazing event ever. So I have four really interesting people sitting around me, so I should really introduce them. So to my left here is Paul Martin, also from the Dunbar, an award-winning landscape gardener and somebody who really goes all the nature. So we'll be talking to you near the end of the show, Paul. You're very welcome. Thank you. That's really interesting. And then to Paul's left, uh, uh, to your right, is Maureen Luna, who is a choreographer, a very experienced dancer, who also works with Kush How are you, Maureen? I'm fabulous, thank you. It's great to be here today. And it's great to have you here too, Maria. And then to my right and your left, I have the amazing Nathan Wheeler, who is a maker. I know from Dublin Maker, but he wears many, many caps. How are you, Nathan? Absolutely fantastic. And then over to my right, I have the awesome Sue Ann Moore, who's a visual artist and a maker, and she's going to show us some great art um, this afternoon. So that's it. This is like literally pop up and go. We are trying to do this in 30 minutes, so hold on to your seats. I'm going straight over now to Sue Ann to find a little bit more about what she does. So, Sue Ann, you are an artist, a visual artist. Describe yourself. We have some pictures here of your work. So you hold the mic and let us know about what, 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 it, what it is that we're looking at. Hold the mic up good. Okay, so these are examples of book art. And you hopefully use old ones. Everyone has like boxes of books lying around the house. And um, acrylic paint or marker, and um, you're good to go. Use PVA glue, design your piece, stick them on the PVA glue, and you have a piece of art in about 40 minutes. Those are examples of fabric upcycling. So everyone's room has got a pair of jeans with bleach or iron marks or delicate fabrics. So what I do is I go and redesign and create art around the, the damage. These are upcycled wine lamps, so I got a lot of people to save wine lamps for me. I spray paint them and then I use acrylic and um, pieces cut from magazine and old fabric or tread and you pop a little LED cork into the top and I make personalised bottle lamps as much for people. They're really beautiful. So why do you do this? Why do you do this? Tell us a little bit about where it all began for you. Um, I've always been into upcycling. I live in charity shops and I see nearly everything I own is second hand but I really care about the environment for the earth. I try and leave the smallest carbon footprint that I can and if I can combine that with art it's brilliant. So a lot of the time when I was younger I couldn't afford proper art stuff. So I'd use stuff that wasn't traditionally art, so leftover hair dye, ashes from the fire, coal, um, the juice from the leaves of the national. Uh, household food products and everything, so I'd have to use those because I couldn't afford to do it. You're amazing, and you're going to make something for us while this show is going on. What are you going to make? Tell us about it. I make these little personal, like, personalised notebooks for people, little zines, so I try and use as much recycled or natural materials in them as I can. And you can put pictures in, quotes, photographs, cover leaves or flowers with PVA glue, they're good to go, they last, stickers that I find or really kind of stuff that I accumulate, um, pieces of paper, wrapping paper, dyes, the back of gift cards, magazines, and I make them as personalised gifts for people. Well, that's absolutely beautiful. So we'll leave you to get busy and um, I'll come back at the end of the show and see what you've made. Thank you so much, Suan. We'll come back to you later. Thank you. So moving onwards now, let's go across here to the amazing Marina Bloomer. So Marina, we have been working together on a new dance piece. So why don't you just tell us about it? It's easy for me to just give you the mic. So yeah, um, it's been a great process, I have to say. Um, so I've been working with two dancers and we have taken inspiration for our movement 
and for all the sort of little movement tasks I've set the young dancers from the presentation that you gave to us. Um, and I have to say, a really inspired speaker. I was like blown away. Um, so I really mean it. <laughs> so from, from that presentation, I wrote loads of notes. We, we videoed it, so we, we recorded it. And um, there were key words and key phrases and concepts and ideas. And an awful lot of actually what you spoke about sort of had action built into it. So there was an awful lot of sort of action words and words like finding balance or, you know, things being out of balance. And just your description of sort of the universe and partly of how the universe works. And I think that is really so. I would say that both pieces, we're going to see one, and it's a lovely gentle piece that I've worked with, with Neve McPhillips, a lovely young dancer. And it's inspired by the idea that if you really realise how amazing this planet is, you know, do something about it to save it or to look after it. And key to all of both pieces, actually, is the sort of phrase that you said. That we, I mean, you recorded for us, but we, we could have taken bits out of it just about how amazing this planet is. And me actually says it, well, I won't blow her game. <laughs> she says it at the end of her so I won't give the game away. But you have a beautiful, poetic way of talking about the planet and about climate change that's, you know, connects on an emotional level, and I think if you connect on an emotional level and a creative artistic level, that is the way forward. I mean, you sort of say, because sometimes science can seem cold, but, you know, climate change ain't cold, as we say, yeah. So it's been, it's been a lovely process. Um, these are sort of, I would say, like movement sketches, so it's the beginnings of, of a, a fully fleshed out piece. We've got, there's lots of kind of ideas that could be developed afterwards. And this solo that we're going to present today is a lovely and um, sort of gentle piece. Um, and Neve has also created her own text based on ideas from yours. So there's the sort of sense of, of appreciating the planet that we live on. And, and it is, do you, are you seeing that the climate is starting to infiltrate into the dance community? Are people responding to it or is what you're doing very different from, from what you're seeing on the ground. I think probably dancers have a sort of connection to the earth. I know that might sound silly, but you know, we dance in our bare feet. We, you know, I, so I would say that every, every dancer is like amazing at recycling or doing, but part of the process is actually connecting to your body, which I think also connects you to the earth, to the idea of being animal human. So I think it's a natural sort of link or a really good vehicle for appreciating the world, climate change, human, how humanity can do good or what we can do. Yeah, I agree with you, Marina. So like a big part of why this exists today is that we all feel that we have to do something, don't we, about climate change. And sometimes uh, there are different forms of communicating that and we have COP26 happening all this week and that's for a certain kind of person but what we all really care about are the people that are here today just doing their shopping and trying to find like interesting access points for them that they can just think about new ways of thinking mm, okay so this is like what Sue Ann is doing and what you're doing what Paul is doing what Nathan's doing there are other more simple ways that we can engage. So, um, so yeah. So we're going to see your uh, a little excerpt from uh, a bigger piece that is happening this Saturday in Science Gallery at two thirty. That's correct, isn't it? Two thirty. Yes. And uh, and Moreno will be there, and I'll be there, and everybody will be there. So uh, at the end of the show, we're going to finish out watching that piece for me. So thanks, Moreno. That's great. And best of luck. Are you rehearsing much now this week? We got much on in terms of rehearsals. Yeah. We. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's an ongoing process. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> You're never done. <laughs> so yeah, we're chipping away. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Marina. And you introduce the piece then when we get to it. Okay, lovely. All right, motoring along. Suan is still there. Let's let's check in on her. How she's doing? Oh my God, she's already made a page. She's already made the cover. It's already beautiful.
What's inspiring you for this piece, Sia? Um, we're going for kind of gentle pastel colours today because the atmosphere is really relaxed and interactive and fluid, so I've chosen those colours and I'm going to kind of get it it's looking lovely so far. I think she's going to go for pinks and roses and doilies and all sorts of stuff. So, lovely stuff. So, let me go over here to the amazing Nathan Wheeler. I kind of have like a, I'm a bit of a fan girl for, for Nathan. I'm just going to get your pictures over here, Nathan. So, Nathan and I, I met online in the midst of COVID uh, uh, when the online double maker happened. And I saw this stuff and I was like, who is this guy? I have to meet this person. So, Nathan, you're, um, tell us about yourself. Just tell us about yourself. I guess I'm, I want to call it a generalist maker. I see things and I go, that's an awesome thing. I want to make more of that thing, or I want to turn that thing into another thing, and then I don't have to buy the third thing. So I, I kind of just got into making as just a byproduct of just loving pieces of history. So little items that have a real world value. Maybe not to everyone, but they embody a little piece of history. They have something about them that's more than just, oh, it is what it is. No, this is a fire hose. This, this is being used to put out real fires. That story communicates into an object value. To me, anyway. To other people, their value is purely intrinsic. But so many things, there's more to it in a real story basis. Why does that matter to you? Why does it have to have story for you? Because anyone can go on any sort of big retailer and they can buy one item. Everyone has that same generic item. And the item has only the value in which its materials are and whatever it functions. Things that I've collected or I've repaired or I've found, they come with a story. And you can take something and you can say, you know what? Here's an item I have. This is not just a lamp. It's not just a, a book cover. It's not just a clock. It's not just a soldering station. It has a story. It has a life to it. It has something that you can share with someone. You can build that historical connection and you can go, this is a real thing. This, this has got something to it. It's more than just what it is. It's got history. All right, well, let's look at some of the things that, um, uh, we'll leave that one to the last because that's about this one. So let's just go through this here. So what are we looking at here? That is a Norwegian running light for a shipping trawler. They made them in the 1940s to the 1970s um, in the part of the Stuartburg factory out in the Netherlands. I picked it up off a guy in Drogheda who turned around to me and said, I bought that this dad. And I was like, I'll give you 20 quid. And he's like, that would be great. And then I got it and then I restored and cleaned it up on Christmas Day because I was over with the in-laws and I was like, this is a great little project. And uh, so I built it, rewired it, and put the whole thing back, and now it's sitting on my kitchen table, and it's just brilliant, it's lovely, it's got such history to it, and it's, you know, this thing was at sea for 20, 30 years before it was retired, it was picked up by some random guy in the stomach, and now it's made its way to me, it still lives on, and I'm even on the ship. This was fun, this was, this is a really mental idea that I had, so if you're ever into making or something, you've got to do an awful lot of um, soldering, so you're going to join wires together. And I bought this. This is a artillery case. So they, you basically get your artillery shells from this. And I bought it off the back of a car from a guy who teaches uh, karate. So he pulled up and he was like, do you want to buy something? And I was like, yes, I'd like a box. And he's like, that's great. I want to see some karate as well. And I was like, no, but I'll take the box. And so I got this big rusty box. And I brought it home and was like, oh, I can put a solar station in here. So laser cut parts, put it all together, and now whenever you want a solar or do electronics, you don't need a mural. I can pull this out in my apartment, open it up, it's never going to break because it's literally military grade, and you can just work away all day on it. It's, it's such a way to make a personalized space as opposed to just a commercial one. So I was, I was out for a while. And I went down to like a salvage yard and I was like, what's this? And this is a copper burner. If anyone is into plumbing or they're into uh, old kind of construction techniques, these would have been used all the time on building sites to mold pipes or to kind of flame down different things. They've since been replaced by plastic and metal. But there's thousands of these things sitting out there, often mostly scrapped for their copper value. And I looked at it and I was like, this thing is awesome. It would be amazing if we could kind of bring it back, give it a little bit of life, and make it burn again. So it was simply a matter of cleaning it up, rewiring it, and then sticking on a brand new Edison light, 
and it just it just looks awesome and it's got a great little bit of history it's the history of construction in this country and it's just absolutely brilliant it's astounding i just i really you, you bring me back to the past or something with your stuff and you you really go for detail making you know so so tell us so this is how long how many hours did it take to convert this first um, probably cleaning up about five to six and then rewiring it about two. So not that long. It, it doesn't actually take that long. Once you kind of get a knack for it and you get the polishers and the cleaners and you make sure you're stripping things down in a safe way, um, the wiring is very simple. Anyone can do this. And when you get it, you go, I know I'm going to make a lamp out of that. Or does it like sit in your house for two years and then you go, oh, I think I could make a lamp out of that? You sound like my wife. Um, yes, it absolutely sits in my house for two years collecting dust until someone goes, you should do something with that. And then I'm like, okay, I'll make a lamp out of it. Oh, another lamp. <laughs> so that's how it tends to go. So that is decommissioned fire hose from Drogheda. So uh, you can use fire hose for about 12 and a half years and then basically the manufacturer says, nope, you got to decommission it. You can't be running around with this fire hose anymore. So I saw a couple of other companies doing it in the UK, in Australia and the States and they were recycling these things. And I was thinking, this is something we could do here. So I, re I reached out to uh, uh, Drogheda County Council and they were like, yeah, of course, take all of these. And then they came down the fire escape thing, the fire pole, and it was the greatest moment of my life. I felt like I was six years of age. <laughs> And I just started turning it into things. And I'm, I'm already a leather worker, so it was just a matter of, you know, you just start punching stuff together and stitching things together and creating different pieces. And it just gives this fire hose a brand new life. And it's got a really cool story to go with it. Like, how often do you carry around, you know, a piece of fire hose? This is put out fires. This was in a fire department. It's the coolest thing ever. Other people might go, that's not very cool. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Like, imagine having a piece of the International Space Station. Oh. Yeah. That's, that's fundamentally the most unbelievable thing ever. Like, imagine someone comes over and you're like, that's from space. And you'd be like, yeah, what do you have there, Janet? You know, it's just cool. It, it's a nifty thing. It's, it, it's having a little bit more than just the average run of the moon. And you can do these things cheaply and effectively. And you can save a little bit of history. From? Like, how do you see that this is something more? Like, so who who do you think helped you start to see the world this way? I don't know. Look, there, there's so many. The maker movement in this country and across the world has taken hold like a fire in so many people's lives. It's no longer just oh, I do this or I do that. Makers are breathing their own. And um, it sounds self-aggrandizing, but it's not. It's makers of people who will take something and they'll go, I want to build this, but I've no idea how to wire, I've no idea how to do leather work, I've no idea how to restore, I've no idea how to do this. And you just figure it out. And you just learn. And the process of learning is therapy. It's calming. It's instructional. It, 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 it gives you an awful lot more purpose than just, I do my job, I get paid, I do this. You have something that gives you a little bit more meaning. And for me, personally, I derive so much meaning from just building things and creating things and pouring my passion into objects and then sharing them with other people. And you just don't get to do that in an awful lot of things, especially it's just a passion project. And that's why I love doing it, and I love to continue doing it for years to come. I, I think you're really inspiring. I think you, you kind of encourage us to really look at, at what we consider to be rubbish and seeing, by seeing the story, it's no longer rubbish. It, it, has, it has meaning and it has value and rather than buying something off the shelf, I mean, this would be something I would prefer much more than just something I bought in a shop. So, so thanks, Nate, and, and, uh, and keep making and keep that passion going because I think you can, we can all agree that what we're doing is really, really special. So thank you. Thank you so much. very much. How are you getting on, Sue Anne? I'm just pulling these over here out of the way, out of harm's way. How are you getting on now? Where are you at? Um, a lot of BBA Blue, so I've just got all the views of all the hair dye, the inside of the pool, and the hand sanitizer, because I've got some water, the water colours, the body, just getting the background on, some leaves and flowers. They're motoring through it. Fair play, just going to get this out of the way as well for later on. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you both. I think you both have a lot in common. I think your processes are different, but I think your your passion for reusing is, is, is the same, and it's just manifesting in different ways. So now we go back to my neighbour, Mr. Paul Martin. How are you, Paul? How are you feeling today? And um, 
you're not just a gardener. I mean, you, you've won many awards for um, some of your designs. So to first you take us through um, just a brief kind of a, a summary of your of your career and, and the work that you've done and, and some outstanding pieces. Um, uh, I've won a few, I've 11 gold medals from around the world. <laughs> from Singapore, Chelsea, Hampton Court. So plenty of medals, yeah. I've been at this for 20 years now, yeah. um, and I think now we may call it, you know, COP26 and whatever, um, but we've been trying to get, get people, probably I'm in a luckier position because I can inspire clients to do more, um, so in a large garden, you know, we can clean the water up, we can plant um, certain plants for insects to feed on. And then, from the bottom of the scale, once the insect population goes up, then the bird population goes up, you know, the castrels, the buzzards, etc., etc. Et so, that's probably the easiest way to describe it. And um, so, we, we worked together about two years ago, and you said to me that your, your love of gardening came from your grandfather, and, and that you, 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 the technical piece. He, he taught you all the Latin of the flowers and everything, didn't he? And then your dad was a teacher, so between the two of them together, you just developed this innate understanding of soil, of air, of wind. And, and you, like I asked you, like, how do you design a garden? I remember you said, I just look where the wind blows, and I look where the light is, and the shadow is. And you kind of, you start from the nature, you don't necessarily start from the plants. Can you tell us a little bit about how your brain works when you design? Well, I suppose if, if it's a, a larger garden, where we've got um, plenty of time to do it, we might spend two, three, four years trying to get it all designed and get it built. Um, there's a lot of different aspects to it because it's like it's like a living sculpture, but it's it's not really um, you know one piece that's done once and you walk away from it. This develops and develops and develops over the years. Um, so you could also have, for example, say foxes. For example, say you've got population of, of the wildlife has been extended, then you may not have seen the foxes a year ago, but you'll see them this year or next year. So everything's there, but you have to start the food, you have to start the water as well, keep it clean. And, uh, and you were talking about um, a piece that you were working on where, tell us about the deer, tell us about the deer that go through the, the garden that you designed with, so just tell us, tell us a little bit. Well, we knew that there was a road track of that the deer would travel along, and they've travelled along that track for maybe a thousand years, two thousand years. Um, but the wildlife um, couldn't get through a lot of it because of barbed wire fences and whatever, so we've taken all those down, and we've extended the hedgerows from a metre wide to ten metres wide. So that gave good ground cover for um, animals and insects to grow. And in the last year, we've had um, Irish red deer were back in stock. They were sharp in their antlers, etc., etc., in the trees. Um, so it is, it's amazing what you can do, even in a year or two, you can change everything. Yeah. And tell us about the garden that you made in South Africa, because that was, I think from talking to you, is you, you design kind of an ecosystem and you design globally. So, so... Well, that one is a 70 acre garden in South Africa. And um, originally, when it was when it was there beforehand, um, it was probably a site where a lot of waste material was dumped and rubbish was dumped. So the water couldn't be drawn up and a lot of the plants weren't particularly great. So we've spent the last two to three years trying to get it back. And we've cleaned the water simply by doing it with waterfalls and get more oxygen into the water. And we now have a report, which we have yet, um, to say that the water is now clean and good enough for drinking, without any mechanics at all. Um, and we've started on growing, you know, herbs and all that sort of stuff around the place for insects and whatever to start, and birds as well. So the population of birds has now increased by about 30% in, in two years. And now birders, if they're called, uh, go to that area to look at birds. Yeah. for the live streamers for following us um, but we're going to continue uh, talking to all these amazing people we'll see you next time, bye uh, and Paul, tell us um, you 
I don't. I think you're more than a gardener. I think you're somebody that actually puts the ecosystem back in place, and it's and it's something that for a lot of us, I mean, it, you know, what you do is amazing. But what advice would you give for us, just simple little gardeners? How can we contribute in our locality to, to promote our ecosystems and bring them back to the way you're able to do them in gardens uh, time and time again? Well, I have a good start with the food. And if you have, you know, reasonable good food for insects and birds, um, it might be, again, I try and bring it back to native plants because native plants, uh, they're used to this environment rather than taking a plant in from, from abroad. Which, would, for example, um, a wild oak tree in Ireland would house and have inhabitants for 340 invertebrates on an oak tree. A cherry tree from Japan would have 20. So that's the difference between the two. So a wild tree from here will house far, far more men than that. How did you get to know? <laughs> like, how do you know all this stuff? Why don't we know more? I just read it, that's it. <laughs> and then you learn, and you know, you know the moss grows on the northern side of the tree, um, and you can plant uh, more shade growing plants in that area, more sunny in the other area. Um, so we plant a lot of euonymus, uh, holly, all the berries that we give the birds plenty of food for the winter. Amazing, you're a real mine of information. I have some pictures here of our, I think this is with Dundalk, is it around Hot Dundalk here, some of your work. So let's just look at these. Look at this one here. Yeah. That's the, the ruin of a uh, uh, house, the new house is built beside it, but um, under planning we couldn't touch it, you know, we couldn't change the whole landscape. So we actually put in a, a large fire pit and then we put wildflowers all around it. That again is in the same job. We've restored an old ice house which was from the 1850s. Um, that's all done with lime mortar. And then we put wildflowers um, on top and on the, the sides. So they came from Sandra Cafola, who is in, I think he's in Carlo Leash. So because he's local, local to Ireland, he's able to guesstimate what plants will grow in that area. Again, that's just wildflowers again, but since since that's, those photographs were taken, all the seeds have come onto the plants and the, you know, the sparrows, etc. in their thousands, which they weren't there before. And even as regards one of the trees, because the wildflowers have done so well, um, we've had bee colonies coming in and resting on some of the trees. And once they know that you're reasonably today if you're not going to burn them, you can pick the colonies up and you can put them into a new hive. Do you get to see the fruits of your labour? Because you've, you've got like a 10 or a 20 or a 30 year plan in your head when you design. So do you ever get a chance to go back and see the fruits of your labour? I probably would because the gardens are ongoing all the time. So you're, you're obviously going to...
this doesn't just happen, you know, there's a lot of people in the background. So um, Sarah and Jeanette and Marie and Sarah Lati, uh, uh, Bridget Webster and Maria, all from um, Pushkin, and Neve, a beautiful dancer. Um, and then we have Liz and Kasu and Eva from British Council and we have Steve and Nick and Diego who's with me and then all these amazing guests today. Thank you so much Paul, thank you so much Nick, thank you so much to Anne and Werner and you for just giving us a tiny piece of your beautiful minds and help us to understand that there are many ways that we can embrace climate change. So you're in it, tell us what we're going to do. So this is a concept is called Shake and Boy. A shrinking violet. I am a plant. I am a species. I am a creature. I am alive. This is the pillar. It holds me up. It keeps me from falling down. It helps me grow. It helps me fly up to the sun and back to the earth. It helps me survive. I love the pillar. It keeps me going. I need the pillar and the pillar needs me. I make it beautiful. I make it unique. I become a part of the pillar. If the pillar crumbles, I crumble with it.
standing on a planet that is pulling us to the ground. We are swimming in air, air that has passed through an insect and is in the wings of a butterfly.